Well, good afternoon. So, for quite some time, I've been looking forward to the opportunity to address the members and guests of the St. John's Board of Trade. And let me tell you, it's been a tough winter. And it's been a great experience in many, many ways. Been some challenges in it, no doubt about it. Uh, got some stellar advice at one point from my grandson, Jack, when there was some talk of increased security might be required. And he said to me, he said, Mimi, he said, don't worry. He said, if anybody comes into your house that's not supposed to be here, robbers or people like that, he said, because I can tell you how to get rid of them. He said, all you have to do is yodel. <laughs> so I'm well armed now. I haven't worried about it since. But you know, when you come to politics, and particularly when I came to politics, because I, I ran for the first time in 93 and wasn't successful, but loved the process and thought that at some time I, I might do that again. But the years went by and the opportunity didn't present itself and I thought my time had passed. But in 2001, when Danny Williams asked me to be part of his leadership team and election readiness team, the journey took another turn. And it always does. It, life is absolutely amazing. I've really come to understand as I get older that it really isn't over till it's over. And I think that's marvelous. In 2003, I had the privilege of running with a group of people who were like-minded in so many ways. And I had heard for a very long time from people about what they wanted from their politicians. And it resonated with me because I felt the same way. I had been working in communities since I was 16 years old. And I was sick and tired of people who said one thing to get themselves elected and did something else once they got there. And I was aligned with a group of people who said, Principles are going to be important to us. The values that have been articulated by the people of Newfoundland and Labrador about what they want from their politicians are important to us, and we're going to live by that rule. And I've had a chance to reflect on that this winter because, you know, we've been through a large public debate in this province on Muskrat Falls. We've come through a budget that's a good budget. It's a very good budget, and I know I'm preaching to the choir. But there were difficult parts of that budget, very difficult parts. You know, nobody holds more respect or value for the public service than we do as a government. These are people we work with every day, on herald uh, workers, pioneers, innovators that drive many of the great things that are happening in this province. And so when you have to say, uh, we have to do this because it is the right thing to do, doesn't mean that it's done without pain, without regret. And so some of that has been difficult. Through that, though, you go back to those touchstones of the principles that brought you here, a good stewardship. I'm not taking a snapshot in time of not doing what is right to be popular. To, the right thing to be popular is not always the right thing in stewardship or in good leadership or in good governance. And so all of those values and those principles as we've gone through some white water over the last little while have, have helped us keep the focus where it needed to be. And where it needs to be is what is in the best interest of the people of Newfoundland and Labrador. And that always has to be the strongest guiding principle. So we worked hard and remained focused on delivering results for the people of Newfoundland and Labrador. And we are delivering. On May 8th, BMO released its blue book, commenting on the consistent strength of our economy and our prospects for the year ahead. No spin, just facts. And what does BMO have to say about our performance? In their analysis, prudent fiscal management by our government and the investments we choose to make in equity shares in projects such as Muskrat Falls and Hebron are benefiting our people. 
Construction and capital investment activity have been key economic drivers in the province in recent years, and growth is expected to remain solid this year. Investment in the oil and gas sector is expected to increase by 83% as construction of the Hebron project ramps up. The jobless rate sits near a record low. Average weekly earnings growth is strong, supporting personal incomes and consumer spending. Projects such as Muskrat Falls and Hebron are creating jobs and opportunity, and our people are reaping the benefits. On each of the measures BMO has identified, this province is the picture of health, strength, and growth. You'd never know it sometimes if you were listening to the chatter that goes on. We will continue to make smart decisions to sustain that success. Because today, we have more doctors and nurses delivering quality health care services throughout our province than ever before in our history. Access to advanced medical equipment and services is greater. And the wait times for key health care procedures are lower. We're leading the country in many of them. In our classrooms, the number of teachers per student is higher, meaning the sizes of classes are lower. The cost of a post-secondary education is lower. The quality of our student aid program is better. The number of post-secondary students studying here is greater. Access to apprenticeships and journey person certification is greater. Job prospects for skilled workers are greater. The number of childcare spaces is higher. There are more people working in our province than ever before. Incomes are higher. Taxes are lower. People are earning more and keeping more of the money they earn than they did a decade ago. On measure after measure, the evidence adds up to one undeniable conclusion. Newfoundlanders and Labradorians are better off, and our economy is much better off now than it was a decade ago when our work began. Our approach has proven to be sound. Our plan is working. Our people are working. Newfoundland and Labrador is in a stronger position today than ever before in our history, and we are moving forward boldly with confidence to grab hold of opportunities even greater, even greater than those we've achieved. I want to update you on some of the things we've been doing and the results we've been seeing since I was here last year. Much of the work our government is doing happens behind the scenes. Most people don't have an appreciation for it. You know, a lot of people will say to me, well, I get two comments all the time. You're really busy, I suppose, never stop. Yes, that's right. Well, that's what you put your hand up for. Hang on now, I wasn't registering a complaint. I was just answering your question. Or the opposite end of the spectrum, even with some members of my extended family, who say, well, the house is closed. I suppose you're off for the summer now, are you? <laughs> Not quite. Because most of what we do, as I say, happens behind the scenes in offices and meetings where due diligence is done, fine details are honed, weaknesses are cut, loopholes closed, I's and T's dotted to ensure that we do not miss out the benefits that Newfoundlanders and Labradorians demand and deserve. Far from the limelight, indeed by the light of the midnight oil, we are continually searching for new opportunities to turn situations to our advantage. One ideal example of this is in the approach we took to strengthen the Boise's Bay Agreement. As many will recall, we expressed concern a very long time ago when we were in opposition about two weaknesses in the original agreement. The first of these was an exceptionally broad force majeure clause that could easily 
very easily, for a lack of supply, lack of labor, relieve the developer of its obligations to develop or to deliver key benefits to the people of Newfoundland and Labrador. That was the loophole you could drive the Mack truck through. You, they could close down the project if there was bad weather. When the developer missed a key legislated deadline, we seized the opportunity to close this major loophole with a reasonable force majeure clause more in line with the industry norm. Just recently, we got the opportunity to address a second concern we have with the initial agreement, namely the absence of a commitment to mine the underground resources once the lucrative surface ovoid de deposit was exhausted. Several months ago, when the developer missed another legislated deadline, we seized the opportunity to secure a commitment from the company to develop the underground resources, greatly extending the life of the mine and enhancing benefits to our people. These are just two examples of the work we have done to secure greater benefits for the people we serve. This work doesn't always make the headlines, but it is making a difference where it counts. And that's the most important thing to our government. We have an obligation to drill down into details and spend all the time that is required in order to ensure that we don't miss out. Due diligence demands that we scrutinize every detail. And while these efforts aren't always visible, they are absolutely vital. And that is why we dedicate so much time and effort to getting it right. To maximize the returns we get from the development of our resources, we also take the time to examine the best practices of other jurisdictions and explore new approaches of our own that can lead to greater gains for our people. Like the most successful private enterprises, governments too can achieve greater gains by challenging old ways of thinking and trying innovative approaches. Melcor, for example, is leading the development of the province's energy resources, including oil and gas. Through Nelcor, we have equity stakes in offshore oil and gas developments. In the White Rose extension, we have 5%. In the Hibernia Southern extension, our equality stake is 10%. And the latest 4.9% in Hebron, a project that was sanctioned in 2012, as many of you know. Through Nelcor's equity stake in the province's offshore developments, we have strategic insight into the oil industry's realities, challenges, and opportunities. We are at the table to ensure Newfoundlanders and Labradorians benefit from these resources for generations to come. Nelcor's interests on behalf of the province not only resides in securing equity stakes in our offshore developments, but it also revolves around attracting as many capable partners to invest in our offshore through the widespread dissemination of quality information. Nelcor, through its exploration strategy, is methodically undertaking activities that will allow us to assess Newfoundland and Labrador's potential for future projects. Our investments in Nelcor Energy to fund its oil and gas activities are yielding significant results. I believe our best opportunities lie ahead of us. And thanks to our government's investment and support for NALCOR, we will reap benefits like never before. For example, since 2010, our government has funded nearly $30 million towards NALCOR's Energy's Geoscience Program. It was invested in a 3D seismic program that spanned from the Labrador Sea in the north to the Flemish Pass in the south. That acquisition of three, 2D seismic data is the largest program in the history of Newfoundland and Labrador, and one of the largest programs ongoing in the world. It is comparable to an area larger than the U.S. Gulf of Mexico. Approximately 70% of the area covered had no previous seismic data and is revealing prospects never before seen. This investment is perhaps the most strategic ever made in our oil industry. 
Our investment through Nelcor was able to leverage nearly $65 million in additional investments from global leading seismic companies, TGS and PGS. And we are already seeing results. Earlier this year, Nelcor announced the discovery of three new large basins in offshore Labrador, doubling Labrador's basin potential. Early analysis, analysis suggests these new Labrador Sea basins have greater probability to be oil prone versus the gas prone basins on the Labrador shelf. This discovery has turned upside down the industry's historic view of offshore Labrador. It is one of the most exciting pieces of work that I have seen since I came to government. And not only because of our timely investment and strategic work to move towards scheduled licensing grounds in our offshore, exploration drilling off Labrador is poised to soar to levels not seen in over 20 years. And you know what? The $30 million we invested, we've already recouped in licensing the, the data, selling it to companies to have a peek at. And we will earn twice, three times the amount we invested through those licensing rounds. But more than that, that's, that's, that's the crumbs. We have opened up a whole new frontier that is so much more exciting than anything that we have seen so far in this industry in Newfoundland and Labrador. And I can't wait as we get more and more events in our work in sharing all of that story with you. So we need to celebrate the fact that we're doing things differently, that we're putting away old ways of thinking and doing, that we have confidence in ourselves, that we're prepared to invest in ourselves when others refuse to do so. They weren't interested. They weren't interested in offshore Labrador. That was the Earth's crust out there. And, and you know, in, Scientific lore says that, you know, there's not going to be oil, but there were oil slicks out there all the time. So now Core said, you know, we need to have a look at them. Is it coming from the bilge of, a, of some passing ship, or is it seeping up from the ocean floor? And guess what? It's coming up from the ocean floor. That's not the Earth's crust out there. That's fertile ground for oil production. That's pretty exciting. And because of this fundamental shift in the way we're managing our offshore, it puts us in the driver's seat. We have the potential with this in new information to gain billions of dollars for Newfoundland and Labrador over the long term. Anyone who still believes investing in Nelcor Energy was foolhardy would have a pretty tough time convincing anyone else in the light of what you just heard. Because of the incredible expertise assembled at Nalcor and the strategic decisions they are taking, Nalcor is projected to be fully self-sufficient in its oil and gas investments as early as 2015, two years before Hebron has first oil. Net revenue from production in its projects, such as White Rose Extension and Hibernia South, will be in excess of 70 million in 2013, climbing to peak revenue of 370 million nine years from now in 2022 with the addition of Hebron production post 2017. We are taking bold and innovative steps to develop our natural resources for the benefit of the people of the province. These initiatives are forward looking and will return benefits for generations to come. Our investments in Nalcor have proven to be wise and sound. And Newfoundland and Labrador is far stronger today because of the exceptional work we have mandated them to do on our behalf. Our growing stature as an energy sector leader is undisputed, not only here, but in fact internationally. We are no longer looking on from the sidelines. We are in the game. It was thanks to the expertise we amassed at Nalcor that we were able to negotiate the agreement with Nova Scotia Zamara that will see the development of our hydropower resources at Muskrat Falls. Not only will it give domestic ratepayers and industries ample and potential access to power at the lowest possible cost, but it also enables us to circumvent 
Quebec's roadblock to energy development in this province and market clean, green, renewable energy to the Maritimes and beyond. No longer, no longer held hostage by Quebec. Today, I'm happy to announce our next step forward with this project as Nelcor has launched the request for financing process. The RFF will invite proposals for the purpose of raising debt financing for the project. The assignment of a triple A rating for the finance raising process and the federal loan guarantee are signals to prospective lenders that the Muskrat Falls project is an excellent financing opportunity. And I'm so glad because the RFF really marks the end of the loan guarantee process. And I got to tell you, I never worked for anything so hard in my life as I worked for that loan guarantee. And I feel like I've been assailed from all sides, truly. You know, people say, oh, you know, what are you giving away? Why, what are you not standing up for? Why are you being nice to the prime minister just to get a loan guarantee? Not true, never would be true. He made a commitment to us in the election of 2011. My job was to hold his feet to the fire. And that's what I've done. And I was listening to the fisheries broadcast as I drove home the other evening. And a caller said, oh yes, old Kathy Dunderdale would give away the fishery for the loan guarantee. Well, let me tell you something. You want to know what the racket was about? On November 29th, it was about the fishery. And the prime minister wanted a quid pro quo for the loan guarantee. And you know what I told him to do with the loan guarantee. No quid pro quos. You promised it to the people of the province. You said that the only requirement was that it have a sound business plan. Well, we've produced it. You give us the loan guarantee. And don't talk to me about fishery at the 11th hour at NPRs because I'm not going there. So I thought the matter was settled. Damned if I didn't have to do it again. Poor old Nigel Wright. The ear is still ringing when I smack the phone up because take the loan guarantee because there is no quid pro quo. Not. And God bless if we didn't come around to it again on the 24th of May week. I'm just as glad it rained and sleeted and snowed because we spent the whole weekend in the office. And we're getting down to it on these seed and negotiations. And fisheries is important. And didn't we get the phone call again to say? And again, you can understand what the message was. A little hard of hearing in Ontario from time to time. He sent, knew I was serious enough that he sent the minister to come talk to me. And I'm happy to talk about CETA. And in CETA, we got to talk about fishery because there are important issues for the people of the province. But the conversation before we ever got to CETA was no linkage. No linkage. Do we have, can we go to RFF? by 12 o'clock on Tuesday? Are we going to have it by 12 o'clock on Tuesday? Well, i got to talk to you about CETA. No, no. No. We're going to talk about loan guarantee. Do we have it? Well, Premier, you're really going to have to let me speak. I said, we were told before you came here that you could speak to the loan guarantee. Can you? Yes. Better speak. So I'm leaving this room if you don't. All right, you'll have your loan guarantee by tomorrow. Now we can talk about the other issue. So sometimes, <laughs> so sometimes it's difficult, you know, because, and this relationship with the federal government is difficult. Make no mistake about it, it is difficult. But you have to get in the room, at least for a little while to make the argument about what's important to Newfoundland and Labrador. It's hard for somebody to understand that if I'm screaming it from down on the waterfront or from the steps a Confederation building. I need them to understand 
the legitimate needs and aspirations of the people of Newfoundland and Labrador. And our expectation as our federal government that you deliver. And if you do not deliver, then tell us why not. And when you make a promise to the people of Newfoundland and Labrador, you keep that promise. You absolutely keep that promise. You don't try to add a half dozen things onto it. So, you know, it's challenging. And someday I look forward to being able to tell the whole story. But, you know, Muskrat Falls is working. The project is underway. The request for financing it, it has started. That, that whole process has started. And we have had an election promise delivered, even though it took a little pushing and it took a little squaring off. It's here, and that's important, because we need to hold them accountable. But don't ever think it's easy. It is never easy. The easy thing to do would have been to walk away from the loan guarantee in terms of political uh, capital and stand up for Newfoundland and Labrador and hammer my fist on the table. And that would have done me a lot of good. And I'm smart enough politically to know that. I've been at this for a while. But it wouldn't have done the people of the province any good. We need Muskrat Falls. It's the best thing for this province for a whole myriad of reasons. And we're not going to walk away from a billion dollars uh, 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 reduced uh, rates for the people of Newfoundland and Labrador for my political or my government's political well-being. Not going not to give that away in order to be popular. So you stand up, you do the right thing, and you hope at the end of the day when everything is calm and sensible and everything, that people will see the right thing of what we've done. And I'm happy to say that our government stood firm through this whole process and did right by the people of the province. I'm happy to be here today to say it. So Muskrat Falls development clearly demonstrates this province's capacity to lead in energy sector development, and that is what we're doing. As co-lead in the development of the Canadian energy strategy, just last month I met with Manitoba Premier Craig Salinger, Alberta Premier Alison Redford, and provincial and territorial energy ministers to discuss the importance of an energy strategy. And it is hard work. It is hard work. Quebec does not want an east-west grid. It has a geographical position in this country that allows it to be a dog in the manger with regard to energy development. And it is making uh, billions of dollars, and it doesn't want to be disturbed. But you know something? You're going to get disturbed. Because even though uh, you know, everybody is not ready to move on difficult issues is not going to stop me from pressing it. And I'm delighted in some ways that BC is, is kicking off a stink about pipelines and not letting Alberta's oil or gas go through BC because, you know, I'm going to say, well, welcome to the club. You know, we've been suffering this in Newfoundland and Labrador for quite some time. It's nice to have some company and we're getting a critical mass and maybe somebody in this country is going to start to pay attention. But it's nice not to be alone. So, you know, when I can talk to Premier Salinger and talk to Premier Redford, and, you know, and I met Kathleen Wynne on the same trip, the new Premier of Ontario, who's very interested in, in renewable green power from Newfoundland and Labrador, let me tell you, then, you know, we're getting a critical mass. And is it difficult to try and move that file forward? You betcha because there's not an appetite at the federal level. When you look at an energy map in Europe or South America, it will blow your mind the amount of reciprocity there is in those countries, even in third world countries. And yet within our province in Canada, we cannot have uh, regulations that allow the wheeling of electricity unless we have commercial arrangements in the United States. It's embarrassing for a country of our maturity and sophistication to have to go to the United States in order to get a, a, a process that would allow us at least to try to move electricity uh, through uh, sister provinces. 
and we need to do something about that. And it may take a long time uh, to do it, but we're absolutely going to keep trying because it's critical to the development of Newfoundland and Labrador. Everything that happens in oil and gas is awesome, but we need something that's going to sustain us long after oil and gas is gone, and renewable energy is that. You know, we have wonderful resources in hydro. We have ridiculous amounts of wind in this province. And with new technology, and out, yes, me, I'm the worst one too. I say that's outside the House of Assembly. But, uh, and, and, you know, there's new technologies around tidal energy, all of those kinds of things. Just how rich are we in all of it? But we've got to be able to get it out of here. There's only a half million of us. There's only so much we can do with it. And we need to be able to get that to market. And so we're not going to stop trying. And, and, you know, for peace, if nothing else, at the end of the day, we might get it. And I've also met with Atlantic Premiers. And, we, you know, we're working together. We're, we're building a process. We're building trust on how we work together collectively as a region. And one of the most uh, key things that we're working on is the critical bottleneck we have, particularly in Newfoundland and Labrador, but in Atlantic Canada, on, on the blocking of certification for apprentices. We've got a real bottleneck, and we need to deal with it. And we've come up with a process, a collaborative process, and, and find a solution that we can work on together that in four years' time we'll see at least 60% of our apprentices having the same uh, requirements throughout Atlantic Canada and therefore able uh, to uh, harmonize apprenticeship programs through the region and deliver online training to small and medium-sized businesses around these uh, work labor force demand. This will make us a national leader in the delivery of critical skills training and that benefits everyone. We also, you know, talked a great deal about the employment insurance reforms. And nobody in this room or nobody in Atlantic Canada is going to suggest that when work is available, people ought to be on EI. But we have industries in Atlantic Canada that rely on seasonal workers. We've got a billion dollar fishing industry that relies on seasonal workers. And yes, Reforms may be required in some areas. However, you don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. You don't punish people because they take the only work that's available to them. We don't drive people out of the province and put industries at risk and then try to solve the problem with temporary foreign workers. That's not the way to do it. You know, this country was built by seasonal employees. There have been towns, for example, in, in, on the Bjorn Peninsula where, where there has been a mobile workforce for 40 years. They built the distance early warning it, system in the north. They built the tracks, the railroad tracks across the country. You know, they're working in Fort McMurray. These people bring value to their communities, to their families, and to the country. And we have to acknowledge that and respect that. You know, tourism is a seasonal industry. And we have to take that into account when we're doing ER reforms. And, and so in the face of the federal government's lack of research to inform uh, the decisions they took around EI, Atlantic premiers have decided to take it upon themselves and to do the research that is necessary so that the appropriate reforms can be made, but we're not cutting the legs out from under businesses and industries in the province while we're doing it. It's important that we have a strong labor force. And with all these mega projects we have coming, we're gonna need 70,000 skilled people over the next 10 years. So we need to do everything that we can to make sure that all our systems are working in an optimal way. Our College of North Atlantic, our university, our Marine Institute, our apprenticeship programs, 
all of those things need to work efficiently and effectively. We need to know what the labor demand is, and then we have to do our part in, in making sure that we're providing the labor supply that is required here to drive the economy over the next 20, 30 years. So we need to focus on the goals we need to be achieving and the most effective and cost-effective way of reaching all of our goals. And that's important as a government too. We need to continue to reduce our debt. We're down by 28% since we took office a decade ago. But you know, when we talk about fiscal sustainability, we need to talk about public sector pension plans. And again, I know I'm preaching to the choir. But we repaid the pension plan every cent that was robbed from it, every cent of interest that would have been earned if the money had never been touched. We've put over $4 billion into public sector pension plans in the last 10 years. And yet 64% of the debt we owe today comes from public pension plan liability and post-retirement uh, uh, benefits liabilities. We have to do something about it. Public sector uh, leaders, uh, union leaders say to us, don't touch, hands off our pension plan. Well, hands off your pension plan is going to go bankrupt. We have to do something because the people of this province don't have $4 billion every five years that we can put into your pension plan to keep it afloat. We need to make sure that you get the benefits that you worked hard for and that you negotiated. And so we have to do something. So yeah, our budget is not just about fiscal discipline in terms of how we deliver services and how we do that in a cost-effective way so that we're not taxing Newfoundlanders and Labradorians to pay more than they need to be paying for the delivery of services. And part of that fiscal management is not only ensuring that programs and services are effective, but that we talk about sustainability of, of everything that contributes to the sustainability and the solid fiscal foundation we need in this province. So not everything. So you know that's a smattering of what has been going on in the last year. All of it extremely important. And not everything we're doing is getting the attention that I believe it warrants. But in forums like this, I'm delighted to have the opportunity to tell the story directly. The worst thing about when I get up here, I don't want to get down. And I know the day is getting out, so I'm getting down now. But I just want to end by saying this. Who can deny that the approaches that we have taken have changed us. You know, I came from a day when young people facing graduation were looking west to find a career and a solid foundation. And now they have a choice to build a sustainable future for themselves right here. A new dynamic is at play in Newfoundland and Labrador, an exciting dynamic. We are dreaming bigger, reaching higher, daring to believe in ourselves and our capacity to thrive. As a province, we are paying our way. That's what it means to be had. That whatever we've got, we're paying for it ourselves. Do we have everything we want yet? Not yet. Not yet. But it will come. We have a spring in our step and confidence in our future. It is no longer wishful thinking to say, tomorrow will even be brighter than today. The transformation is happening right before our eyes. A couple of weeks ago at the Offshore Technology Conference in Houston, I had the opportunity to speak with companies from all over the world and listen to them talk about our young people, how capable they are, how motivated. We have every reason to be proud. Our investments in their future are reaping dividends, not just for them personally, 
but also for our province's reputation as a go-to jurisdiction for quality and a work ethic second to none. It is for the generations coming up behind us that we are working so hard to maximize our potential and make this growth sustainable. We are the stewards of our future. There is no doubt in my mind whatsoever that we can sustain the new growth we are experiencing. We have the resources, we have the insight, we have the ingenuity and the resolve to make it happen. And I invite all of you to join with us, focusing on priorities, collaborating, innovating, doing our due diligence, and delivering results. Thank you so much.